This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, journalist Liza Mundy on the history of women at the CIA. Women proved oh, sort of over and over that in spycraft, when you're moving around the street, when you're meeting with assets, trying to get people to pass secrets to you or running exfiltration networks, it really does help to have people underestimate you and just think, oh, that's an ordinary housewife. For the Naval Code Breaking Service, there was literally a document that said, new source, women's colleges. <laughs> and, and, you know, up until then, an educated woman really could just expect to be a school teacher, if that, and only while she was single. Early analysts who were recruited, they were described as sneaker ladies, as women in tennis shoes, because they worked at desks. They, did, they hadn't even been overseas, operations officers. And yet they were pioneering this new kind of intelligence gathering. Liza Mundy, welcome to Chatter. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm really glad we could do this in the studio, too, which, yes, is, which is really exactly. nice since we're both locals. Um, so I have to admit, I was very excited uh, when, and maybe even a little jealous, actually, when I heard that your book was coming out, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Because when I was a young intelligence reporter, starting right around 9-11, I remember one of the first things that I learned about the CIA's history with Osama bin Laden, which surprised me and always fascinated me, um, was that, and your book goes into great detail about this, is that there was just a very large number of women who were involved in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. And that was something that was a story that people, I certainly didn't know, and people didn't realize the role that women at the CIA played in this outsized role. Uh, in this part of history. And so I'm so excited that somebody wrote a whole book about these people. And you go way back to obviously before 9-11 too. Um, so this is a, to start with, how did you get interested in this story? What made you want to write about women at the CIA? Well, it it is in some ways a successor to my last book, Code Girls, which was my first foray into writing about the intelligence community. And that book looks at uh, it's it's historical and and tells the story of 10,000 women who were recruited in 1942, 43, 44 to come to Washington to work as code breakers, and that was a massive effort to break enemy codes and ciphers. Uh, during World War II, and it was our our, co our domestic co-breaking force was majority female, yeah. uh, because the men were all fighting, and that was a fascinating experience for me reporting that. And I knew that during World War II, when we have to really start to build our modern intelligence uh, community, and and we didn't have the CIA or the NSA or uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, certainly didn't have a space force. Right. <laughs> uh, so we have 18 agencies now, but we didn't have any of that uh, in World War II. And it all had to get off the ground and they had to scale it, as we would say yeah. now, so quickly. And so I knew all along when I was writing that book that there was a parallel cohort of women who mm. were recruited to uh, become officers for the OSS, the mm -hmm. Office of Strategic Services. I, uh, as a home cook, I'm I'm worship at the shrine of Julia Child, yeah, and she is the most famous uh, OSS uh, female officer. And I'd always been intrigued by that part of her biography. And of course, there were thousands of women who were recruited into into the OSS during the war, and they were often recruited as clerks and secretaries. As mm -hmm. as you know, I I have a. a a chapter where I talk about how they were tested and evaluated for both their aptitude at filing uh, and retrieving memos, but also at their ability to withstand, uh, to, to put up with uh, had being underused and mm -hmm. underutilized and, mm -hmm. and uh, brought in, very qualified women brought in as secretaries. And then during the course of the war, they, they uh, very quickly ascended, uh, you know, to play influential roles. So I had been interested in the World War II part of the story. And like you, after after Code Girls came out, um, well, it, in part, this started with a mysterious summons that I got from mm. the history office at the CIA. Oh, wow. And and they reached out, as we say, and, and invited me to, I wouldn't say an undisclosed location, but a nondescript suburban office uh, where I found myself meeting with like, it seemed like a dozen historians because they, uh, the CIA 
obviously has its own story about women, yeah. women's contributions. And they had recently published a kind of a pamphlet called From Typist to Trailblazer about, uh, you know, sort of somewhat promotional, you know, sure. uh, uh, yeah. uh, about women's role at the CIA. And and along with it, there had been some declassified. There were some documents declassified, which doesn't happen very often. Not at all. Yeah. And, and there were – it was a sort of a hodgepodge of – um, some personnel records of scattered women during the war. It wasn't really clear to me why these particular women had their personnel records declassified, but whatever. And there were some there were some uh, results of uh, various surveys that had been conducted over the years during the Cold War. There was something called the Petticoat Panel in the 1950s, convened by Alan Dulles to figure out why women weren't getting promoted, and um, it was really called that. So so Amazing. they they wanted to let me know about this. And and they also mentioned Alex Station and 9-11. And just as you say, the women who were uh, who were instrumental in the hunt for bin Laden. And But I was looking back at my notes. They said something like, well, you know, of course, <laughs> that will be 20 years before anybody can really write on that or oh, anything. Wow. So I thought, oh, oh OK. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Why then, am I here then? Right, yeah. right, right. Well, they just sort of wanted to, they wanted the uh, they wanted, I guess, it to be known that well, the NSA has their origin story that's female. Well, ah, you know, we do too. Yep. And and so um, I came back from that and and was thinking about it and still kind of promoting Code Girls. And sorry if this is a longer no, answer. No, I love this answer. Yeah. This is great. Um, but then I I also sometime later I got an email from my esteemed colleague Peter Bergen, and it was uh, it was the subject line was your next book. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, because Peter really became aware of the female component yeah. of the both the both the hunt for bin Laden and the group of female analysts who yes. were warning about 9-11 yes. uh, uh, before 9-11 happened. And people like Gina Bennett and Cindy Storr and Barbara Sood, mm-hmm. who were calling attention to the threat of bin Laden and al-Qaeda and having trouble um, getting the message through in mm-hmm. the big institutional bureaucracy of the CIA. So uh, that was intriguing. And I, I, I contacted a couple of those analysts to see if they would talk to me. And the more I started researching both the hunt part that occurs after 9-11 and then the pre-9-11 part where these women were trying so hard to uh, to call attention to the threat, uh, I, I I was talking to them, but I, I just sort of put some notices in various um, publications and newsletters saying, well, I'd like to talk to any other women who uh, – from any yeah. period of time. And I got a surprising number of responses. And – once I started talking to women who had served during the 70s and the 80s and the mm-hmm. uh, Cold War, I realized that if you're going to understand why women at the CIA were in a position to be observing this this emerging threat after the de- collapse of the Soviet Union, but weren't in a position yet in this bureaucracy to really be given full credibility and listen to, you have to kind of understand the whole historical yep. story. You have to understand how women have been channeled into certain niches of the agency that were jobs that were important but weren't prestigious that position them to be analyzing and observing this new threat and also creating this field of targeting that mm-hmm. would really come yes. to fruition during the hunt of tracking individuals, which was very different from Cold War espionage. Mm-hmm. I mean, not completely a bit different, but it was a new skill. That and, was distinct. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, that 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 involved scouring databases. Yes. You know, not being out in the field, glad handing or pounding back, you know, vodka with with KGB right. uh, agents. So so I, I realized that it was going to have to be a much larger history to try to tell the whole story, so that so that readers could really understand why the women were there, why they weren't listen to or, or how they had to just m- make their way through so many layers of bureaucracy and so many managers uh, mm-hmm. to try to make their voices heard, uh, but also why they were in a position after 9-11 to, uh, to really hone their skills to come to terms with their own collective and personal senses of failure right. and, uh, and to, uh, to, to make the hunt happen. Yeah. 
And we'll talk about that soon, too. And there are some stories of just genuine heroism and real tragedy that happened yeah. to that with women as well. And that, but let's let's go back and talk about a little bit about the OSS. You know, this this storied precursor to the CIA. You know, Wild Bill Donovan and his you know you know all of these the stories of the men he's recruiting from Yale of you know right. I want somebody who can like win a debate in a bar fight. I forget right. exactly, exactly the phrases. Right. But mm-hmm. but we know what, obviously women played such a big role in this because of people like Julia Child and you know others who have you know kind of come out historically now uh, to sort of, you know, give a picture of this agency that actually was recruiting from, you know, both sexes. What were particular qualities that the leaders of OSS thought about? Were there ones that, that women had that made them appealing candidates for this? Or was it that it's an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing and, like, we just need bodies and kind of get in here? Well, it was all-hands-on-deck for sure. And, and again, we're scaling up these a- these agencies or services as, as quickly as possible after Pearl Harbor when all of a sudden the men are being, you know, sent into harm's way all over the world. And we've just been terribly surprised at Pearl Harbor that's exposed our – intelligence yeah. lack of intelligence major capability. intelligence failure yeah yeah, yeah. so so the the um you know, when I was doing my research both for Code Girls and for the Sisterhood, there are these documents where you can literally see the light bulb moment going on over somebody's head. Oh, if all of the fine, educated young men we would normally recruit into this service are unavailable, let's see what these what the women can do. And so for for the Naval Code Breaking Service, there was literally a document that said, new source women's colleges. And, <laughs> and, you know, up until then, an educated woman really could just expect to be a school teacher, if that, and only while she was single. Right. And similarly, there is uh, when um, when Donovan went overseas to meet with the British spy agency and sort of learn how it was done and model the OSS after uh, the what we call M- MI6, uh, he, he, the, the British had been deploying women in positions since at least since World War I, and um, often, again, as clerks and secretaries, but also as keepers of files and keepers of secrets. Mm. And, and uh, because we forget that these, once the intelligence is collected at these agencies, uh, that it, it has to be recorded and yes. it has to be written down. So, yes. so both all, all these services in World War I, they were like vast, vast archives of file card, three by five file card, index cards, you know, with all this incredible information on them. So, of course, you need women to deal with the, pa- do the paperwork. Right, because the and, men won't right, do that. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> so, uh, so that, so there was apparently when Donovan was taking notes, he wrote the word women and circled it. And so that is part of what led right. to um, the recruitment of women. And and so he also, as with the men of the OSS, he was recruiting from highborn families, you know, the elite, uh, the gentry. One of the women who became a secretary, Eloise Page, was one of the first families of Virginia, you know, Virginia gentry. And uh, and so they were looking for coming from a fine family because they believed, what, that you're going to be a more patriotic or loyal American? I mean, that didn't necessarily turn out the case oh, right, with yeah. some of the spies during the war yeah. uh, who were passing secrets to the Russians. Um, but but they were, as I said, one of the when I was doing the World War II research, I read this fascinating document called Assessment of Men that uh, – that laid out in in beautifully written uh, – it was a beautifully written report. That's the other great thing about World War II is the people working with the government were just great writers. The better writing, just, wasn't it? They could yeah. just let it rip. They weren't being careful yeah, at, nice. or not as careful. They were really much more opinion <laughs> and just more writerly, yeah, the documents. Yeah. Uh, and so – and so this report was tells the story of, you know, not just women, but when you're creating a spy service, you have to recruit people not only who have skills and who have m- maybe education or not that maybe that's not so important, but, you know, people who can – Parachute in occupied France, uh, people who can work with a network of, uh, of saboteurs, uh, mm-hmm. people who can parachute into Norway, cross-country ski. But not just that, people who can read, read documents and write up reports and draw up maps and work with liaison services. And so they needed all these, these competencies, but also qualities of character. So the OSS set up training schools, or actually assessment schools, mm. and they would send men who uh, applied or were recruited to test them f- looking for leadership, looking for the ability to put up with frustration. And they would create these fictional scenarios in which you're, you're at a camp in 
somewhere in Leesburg, Virginia, you know, rolling Piedmont country, and you're standing at a small stream, and and you're they were told the men were told to imagine uh, this is a rushing river, and it, there are cliffs on either side, and and you have a machine gun you need to transport, and you're being pursued by the Gestapo, and you have to pretend that these two by fours are logs or felled trees, and how are you going to create a bridge, you know, to get the machine gun? And here, here's a roll of paper towels. That's your machine gun, and how are you going to get it across? So they created these fictional scenarios where the men could imagine themselves as commandos, and uh, and they and they would be observed to see how who emerged as a leader, who was given, who was listened to, who could figure out how to nail the two by fours together, and and they and they, but then then in the evening when they were having dinner or drinking, they would also be observed who who drank a lot, but who could hold his liquor, and and you know keep his head while others were getting drunk. Uh, and so they were they devised this test for the women as well, where these incredibly they were looking for educated professional women and they found them at a time when there weren't that many. So they have these uh, this again, assessment of men talks about most most of the women or more than half of the women recruited were college educated. Mm-hmm. Only four percent of American women at that time were college educated. So they wanted educated women. Many of them were working. Uh, maybe in advertising or in New York. And, and, and so they called them in and they put them in a room together. And their task was, OK, here are 10 memos. You need to you need to devise a filing system where they could be easily filed but easily retrieved. And you need to work together to do this. And they were being tested for their ability to work together, for their ability to set up a good system. Hmm. And this became so important with targeting. Totally. I mean, it is a direct line totally. from figuring out information systems Systems. What's a good system where we can record, you know, where we can keep this valuable information that we have, you know, ultimately when we're targeting about people and where they are in the world and who they're communicating with and who their confederates are and uh, and, you know, sussing out alliances. So back during World War II, the women were set to this task and they were being observed for their ability to work together uh, in a competitive situation where only some of them were going to get high, uh, high level positions, higher level positions. Uh, and also their ability to tolerate, again, being underestimated mm-hmm. and underused. Mm-hmm. So uh, so what was your question? <laughs> no, that, 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 that's a, well, this is – yeah. it, it kind of yeah, gets how to – Yeah, that's what, what they were looking for. Yeah. I and, mean, they and were they, figuring out what they were looking yes. for because then you also, like Julia Child, I mean, you have to be able to not get seasick when you're put on right. a – you know, when you're put on a slow boat to China. Right. And, and, right. and she was apparently very calm when they were flying uh, over mountains in China and she was a jolly shipmate and she was fun. And, uh, and she turned out to be, you know, very hardy and resilient. So – uh, and, and adaptive, I would think too. I mean, I, I, there's, I, I've only met one woman who uh, who has sadly passed away, who was in the OSS. Mm-hmm. Her name is Frances Cornbluth, and I met her when she was in her 90s. And she's a painter on this island that I go to in Maine with my family. And when she joined the OSS, she could speak French, mm-hmm. and so they put her basically in a position where when when reports were coming through that were in French, you know, kind of read them, whatever, and then route them to the right people mm-hmm. based on what was in the document. And she was good at that. And so the one day they said, well, we're going to put you on the German documents too. She said, but I don't speak German. They said, well, here's a German-English dictionary. <laughs> You'll figure it exactly. out. Exactly. You'll figure, You'll figure it, out. it out. And that's what they were looking for. Yeah, that yeah. is actually a great summation. You'll figure it out. Yeah. And they must have found this to be incredibly appealing work too, right? I mean, it's exciting. It's public. It's a it's, it's, it's spy agency. I mean, we didn't yet have an imagination in popular culture of what right. working for a spy right. agency meant. But right. they must have exactly. found this very appealing. Exactly. There, was no, there were no James Bond novels mm-hmm. yeah, that would come out of the war, uh, and Ian right. Fleming's uh, participation right. in the war. But you're right, and and you know what you just said, you'll figure it out, is uh, is exactly the quality they were looking for, and that was really too. When I started interviewing women who worked for the clandestine service mm-hmm. during the Cold War, who were often hired as clerks, uh, or or made to work unpaid as wives. Uh, they figured things out, you know. Yeah. They figured it out as they went along, and uh, and and ultimately rose, you know, to join the class and clandestine services yeah. officers. So that that I mean, I think you really put your finger on the key trait that they yeah. they, they were looking for, and maybe without even knowing it. Right, right, and, and that becomes probably part of the culture yeah. for the agency going forward. I mean, you have this great line too that in wartime espionage, women confirmed the covert value of being underestimated. Right. And that's such a a great line and an insight that it seems like some of the ways that women could make good spies is that men just didn't suspect that they would be. 
Right, exactly. They were um, w- one of the great stories that's come out about World War II is the contributions of Virginia Hall, yes. who was a woman from Baltimore. And actually, she wasn't recruited by the OSS. She was in Europe, and she was recruited by the British, by the SOE, uh, because she was she was you know one of these adventurous sort of debutante types. Or she came from Baltimore High Society, but she wanted to do interesting things. So she just happened to be in in Europe when war broke out in Europe, and she was I think she was trying to get out of Spain. Maybe she had been, I don't know if she was driving ambulances or something, but, uh, and, and, and she met a British recruiter who realized that a young American woman, we had not yet joined the war, could move around unobserved through occupied France as a journalist. And, uh, and so she was in Europe and then she began running exfiltration networks. They put her into occupied France and she was incredibly resourceful and figured it out and very good at taking care of, of the, uh, of the the people who were running these networks and 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 so she she was able to move around unobserved um except for the fact that she had blown her leg off in a hunting accident and had a wooden leg. And so the Gestapo eventually look, was looking for the limping lady. They Amazing. would they would look for the woman limping in the street. So um but yes, uh women uh it women proved oh, sort of over and over that in spycraft when you're moving around on the street when you're meeting with assets trying to get people to pass secrets to you or or p- picking up secrets or running exfiltration networks, it really does help to have people underestimate you and just think, oh, that's an ordinary housewife. Of course, she has grocery bags. Of course, right. she has a baby carriage. Right. I'm sure there's a baby in it's that the carriage. Perfect right? cover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's obviously then there's this transition, you know, from when OSS becomes CIA and then they moves very quickly into, you know, a Cold War footing. And talk a little bit about that. And, and you, you write about how in the Cold War, women in the agency were discouraged from having families and from having children actively discouraged and one would say barred uh, from really from having children. I mean, this was such a change uh, from World War II. And I've always been interested in this transition. During World War II, the government set up daycare centers for the first time. And they sent recruiters around the country to encourage women. It's okay to put your kid in daycare. You've never heard of daycare, but it's good for children to be in daycare because we need you in the factories and we need Uh you in the government service. And we need you, you know, sort of running everything domestically during the war. And so, but then after the war, immediately after the war, all that was shuttered. The daycare centers were shuttered because they were they were seen as communist. That you know the communists raise their children in collectives. Right. We don't do that in America. <laughs> and right. so the women, just as there had been all of these recruiting uh, ads and newsreels and posters to bring women into the workplace during the war, the same propaganda effort was made to drive them home. Okay, ladies, it's time to leave. Thanks yeah. for your service, but it's time to go back home and have uh, have children. And so uh, the but and that happened, but but it not everybody went home. Mm-hmm. And so uh, somebody like Eloise Page, who had been William Bobble Donovan's secretary during the war, she didn't. She didn't want to. She didn't want to get married right away. And, mm-hmm. and and she she was doing really interesting, valuable work. Ultimately, by the end, she was in Europe. She was helping build files on ex Nazis who were trying to escape. So she was working with liais- liaison services, building the file collection. Mm-hmm. That's gonna. Doing I mean, the really the really <laughs> targeting, targeting, hunt, man hunting, and targeting. And so she's like, no, I like this, and I'm good at it, and I'm gonna stay on. Yeah. And so it was it was like it, it's even hard to evoke how accepted it was that a woman who wanted to stay in government service, particularly intelligence work, uh, could not marry and could not have a family. No, you know, it was believed that no man would w- would tolerate, you know, having a wife who was working, but certainly having a wife who was working in intelligence, certainly having a wife who was working overseas. And so as the Cold War unfolded, uh, women like Eloise Page and and I, I also interviewed, a, a, wrote about separately a group of women who uh, stayed on at the NSA, and they were working the Russian code system that uh, the Russians had used during the war. It was called Venona. Mm-hmm. And they worked on that for years, for decades, uh, to figure out code names of who was spying during World War II for the Russians. And all those women remained single. They just gave up. Uh, the ability to have families. They love their work. Yeah. And they, they just a huge accepted. Contribution too. And they just accepted that this was the price that they had yeah. to pay. And so um, a number of the women I interviewed who did fight their way into the clandestine service during the Cold War, the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and, and to work as spies during 
overseas, to work as CIA officers overseas, recruiting foreign nationals to betray their own countries and hand over secrets. These women were explicitly told, um, you, you, you must remain single and you certainly can't have children. Uh, and, and some of the women in my book did marry fellow officers. They, cause you know, it, it's, um, they, 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 this is still the case in the CIA. You know, it's a very mm-hmm. closed society. Yeah. And so, if they did get married, they would they married uh, other men who were doing the same kind of work uh, with the expe- expectation, well, that we'll, we could go overseas as a tandem couple. Yeah. But what's it's just, again so hard to believe? And this was true in the Foreign Service. When you married, even if you married a colleague, <laughs> you were expected to quit to resign if you were a woman, and that was true in the Foreign yeah. Service. And uh, it was just you that you you were seen as having wasted your training dollars. Well, we trained you, <laughs> and now you're going to get married, and we're going to quit. And they, the women didn't want to quit, but it was just like the mindset was couldn't just like the institutional mindset just couldn't be open enough to think. Well, yes, she could still do her work, but what the woman was expected to do. One of the women in my book, Lisa Harper, when she uh, was recruited to train as a uh, she wanted to train as a case officer and insisted upon it. But when she married a fellow case officer, she was made to resign. So her career just went ended before it began, mm-hmm. it looked like. But she was expected to follow her husband underseas and overseas and to work f- on his behalf right, and on the station's him. behalf under what was called housewife cover. So taking advantage of this inconspicuousness to work for the U.S. government, but, you know, unpaid and unrecognized and her career just stalled for a decade. It's amazing, isn't it? And there, there, I've read some other books about, you know, um, recruitment efforts by the CIA in Moscow. The wives were expected to be involved operationally. Operationally. And they were trained. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they were trained to work operationally. And they weren't, you know, they weren't being paid for it. It was, right. a, it was a two for one. Yeah. Uh, the government said, oh, this is great. We're going to get two for the price of one. And she can make the dead drop or the car toss. Uh, right. She can drive. She can watch for surveillance. And, uh, and, and women did. And they did it with enthusiasm. And you really needed, actually, when I say they did it with enthusiasm, some did. And it was important for a man to have a wife who was willing to get with the program and felt okay about this, about recruiting foreign nationals put to betray their country and put their lives at risk. Because I remember one of the women I talked to in the book said when she was in Moscow, she talked to one of the wives and one of the wives was like, I don't I don't know about this. You know, I have some moral qualms about this. And uh, that was not good for a man's career. And it was also not good for a marriage. Yeah. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of divorce. There was a lot of divorce at the time. There's still a lot of divorce. And, um, you know, when I was talking to Carl Colby about his mother, Barbara Colby, who was William Colby's first wife and followed him all around Europe and then to Vietnam, he talked about during the Vietnam War, the wives started getting qualms and just like, you know, we're not we're not on board with what hmm. seems to be happening in Vietnam. And it did, he said, you know, it did, it was problematic for the men's careers. I mean, problematic on a lot of levels. Yeah. But it became, you know, it was one thing to be a loyal, loyal wife in Europe during the struggle against communism, but to be a loyal wife in Vietnam when you see how that's unfolding, uh, you're like, mm. Yeah. I, yeah. And you really put, you put your finger on there's something there too about the moral quandaries of espionage. I mean, when you're sure. recruiting people, you rightly said it, you're, you're recruiting them to betray their own country. And so that I could imagine that that would be something that if you disagreed about that in a marriage, that is not going to be something that you can easily put to the side about yeah. like we have different politics or yeah. we root for different sports teams. Right, exactly. It's not the exactly. same. This it's is not much like more voting. fundamental. Mm-hmm. And what's also interesting about that is the, the recruitment aspect of it is it was also widely believed at the time um, institutionally, and and I these declassified documents, male officers, including some CIA, future CIA directors, had no problem uttering this on the record. Is that women can't recruit? Women can't close that deal. Women are not capable of sitting down at a table with somebody and saying, "Okay, I want you know, I want you to become my asset. I want you to." Sp- uh, I want you to betray your country that that just simply it was believed, you know, that women couldn't work on Wall Street effectively yeah. that way, that they women couldn't be rainmakers. They couldn't bring in big clients. It, 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 this was true, obviously, in the private sector as well, that they just didn't have the balls or whatever that it took to close that really to make that hard ask 
and close that deal. And so that was one of the uh, that was one of the biases that for years made it very difficult for women to to join the clandestine service as case officers. So th- this is actually an interesting point you explore in the book too is the difference between case officers and reports right, officers yeah. and that women found more work, I think more work more easily mm-hmm. as reports officers. Absolutely. Talk about the different first tell us what what are the what are the differences between a reports officer and a case officer and why was it easier for women to find work as reports officers? Right. So um, those sound like really boring terms, case officers. And so, of course, we usually say spy. And then people at the CIA say, well, we're case officers. We're not really we're spies. Not spies. We're not spies. We're, we're hiring the officers. spies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. The other people, the people, the assets that we're recruiting. And like sometimes I'll run like, OK, who are the spies? OK, the assets are the Novara Nationals you're recruiting. You're there as a case officer. So wait. Can we never say spy, you know, in your, in your view? But anyway, yeah. uh, so the case officer, and this was the most sought after position at, at the CIA, uh, at the most prestigious, uh, is to be that person who is trained for months and months and months to live overseas, to work undercover, uh, often under diplomatic cover as a diplomat. So to have a day job, uh, it's sometimes in the private sector, but generally in, in some form of government service, they think you're the visa processor or what are the third secretary, but you're really a CIA officer. And so your real job, your night job, is to is to spot, recruit, and then handle foreign nationals who become your assets, who are going to deliver these secrets, who are going to pass to you the intelligence that their government is trying to hide from our government, or the, the secrets that the government, uh, their own government won't share with us. And so, you, you know, all sorts of meetings. Uh, it's a very social job. Mm-hmm. You go to, uh, certainly it was during the Cold War, you go to diplomatic receptions, you go to parties, you're, you know, there's a, definitely a spy versus spy because obviously the other services are doing the same thing to, to the U.S. Uh, but you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, who here knows what I need to know? Mm-hmm. Uh, who's got that information? How how can I get to that person? How can I recruit? How can I butter this person up without being suspicious? And again, this is where wives were really useful because they could go over and butter up the person's wife and invite him to dinner, a social event. It looks, you know, more natural. And and then and then we're cultivate this person for a period of time and then finally tell them who you really are and what you really want them to do. And and that is what a case officer does. This person becomes this is their case. And uh and you're running this. You're running this asset, and this is your case. So, the, so the case officers are are ideally um, gregarious, uh, social, likable, glad hander. Again, sort of like you know, I don't know, a, a deal maker, a stock or a broker. journalist. Yeah, a journalist. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they have good people skills. Uh, extroverted. Uh, and and but also you know able to make that ask yeah. and and as Lisa said Lisa Harper said you know they're looking for people who can dwell in that gray zone and be okay with that uh, and so so that person is out on the street gathering secrets meeting in you know hotel rooms and and cars uh, and then scribbling down notes afterwards and then um, and then th- but then they have to go back to the office and they have to write it up and they have to write two reports after each meeting one about the intelligence that was transmitted and the other report is about the person the source the asset um, he is you know he's in his 50s well I don't know about his marriage right now his access still seems to be good, but you know, here's what I know about this person, uh, my asset, and and how his life or his and I would say or her life, but for a long time they were really just recruiting male assets, um, and uh, and and those reports have to be written up, and and case officers really didn't like to write because they really needed to be out on the street working. So this is when they would hand their report over to the reports officer, who was like the editor, yeah. and she. Uh, and she was also clandestine. Uh, she was serving in the station overseas. She was expected to be single, a bride of the agency. And uh, and she would take that information and figure out, OK, is this source really reliable? Because she's reading a lot of other intelligence. She's reading cables coming in from all over the world. She's reading the local newspapers. Maybe she speaks Spanish if she's in a Latin American country. She's keeping tabs on what the newspapers are saying, on what other intelligence officers are reporting in other stations. She's processing a lot of 
contextual intelligence and open source information that the case officer isn't necessarily reading. Mm -hmm. So she can put it in context and say, eh, you know, you say that this guy is reliable and has given you information. Well, I happen to have read in the newspaper that he's been fired. He's lost his job. And he's actually just giving you information that is in the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's that's exaggeration. But but one woman did offer that to me as an example. She said this so-called colonel who still wanted his paycheck from the CIA right, right. hadn't told his asset, that his agent, his office or his CIA officer that he had actually lost his job. Um, and so he was just reading the local papers. And, and so so because there's this phenomenon with if you're a case officer of falling in love with your asset, they called mm -hmm. it believing, oh, this is great intelligence I'm getting. And this is the most important. This needs to go to the president right now. Right. <laughs> and so so the reports officer has to be sort of the truth squatter. And again, yes. Shane, it's just like being a journalist and an editor. Totally. You're like, oh, my God, I have this great story. And the editor's like, well, I don't know. Like we did also we did a story on that two weeks ago. Like, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, and so the, the reports officer is like sort of the first. First line of defense, but she's also talking back to headquarters and saying, "Okay, but the analysts back at headquarters, this is what they need to know. Right. So the next right. time you meet with this good asset that you're working with, you need to ask these questions. These, this is what Langley needs to know. This is what the president needs to know. So she's also the line of communication back with headquarters. So it's a really important job, but again, it's desk work, and mm -hmm. that is what women were believed to be good good at. Um, oh yeah, women are careful, and women should work." indoors. This is what one reports officer told me. She said, well, the women worked indoors and the men worked outdoors. Wow. And that it was believed that that was, you know, women are good at communicating. So women would communicate back with headquarters and they would communicate with the the case officers, and they would sort of rein the boys in. You know, there was a boys will be boys attitude. Yeah, sometimes the case officers are going to lie or exaggerate what this, you know, the value of this asset. And so the women have to be the the truth squatters. And or, like the, or like the mother in that figure. The mother, or exactly. Yeah. The den mother, the yeah. nurse ratchet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the killjoy. Wagging her finger, yeah. Right. So, right. Um, so, again, these sound like really sort of dry positions, reports officer or case officer, but they were crazy. Critically important. There was a, a lot of, you know, arguing. And, and, and the reports officer said, you know, because some of these guys, the famous case officers, the Dewey Claridge or um, Alan Wolf, you know, who were really larger than life figures and a number of them, you know, up to really uh, problematic activities, particularly when it came to covert action. They were also, and they were all uh, often drunk, and they were huge womanizers, as we would say. I mean, yes. it was a clandestine life yes. permitted all sorts of secret meetings, and almost anything was tolerated of a heterosexual male yeah. right. overseas. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, threesomes, uh, mistresses, whatever. And, uh, and but, but the women, some of the reports officers said to me, these guys were also really fun, you know, hmm. like, it, it, and in that way, it's like journalism too, you know, like newsrooms are fun. Yes. And sometimes problematic <laughs> male bosses with large personalities are actually really problematic, but sometimes, you know, they're fun to be yeah. around. Uh, and so there was a lot of drinking, a lot of, you know, collegiality and, and, and again, a very insular group of people that if you work in the station overseas, you're hanging out with. So um, so that's a long, wordy answer to your question of the, these two roles yeah. that during the Cold War in the clandestine service, which involved obtaining intelligence and also covert action. Yeah. Um, there was a real distinction between what the men were believed to be good at and what the women were believed to be good at. And I think that it also gave some men who were case officers the excuse to kind of minimize or diminish the work that women were doing even as reports officers. Yeah. I, I, when I was reporting yeah. on when Gina Haspel uh, was nominated by President Trump to be CIA director and the first woman director in the history of the agency, I remember talking to a man who'd been in the operations directorate, who'd been a case officer, and I said to him, I said, well, tell me a bit about, you know, Gina and her background. You know, of course, you know, she was in operations. She was a case officer. And he stopped me and he goes, she was a reports officer. Exactly. And he said it so dismissively. Wow. And it was so shitty. Yeah. <laughs> and it really was. And I thought to myself, like, okay, hold on a second. Like, I, I get where you're coming from on that and you're trying to put her work down. You're overlooking, by the way, her entire career that also got to her to this place. But it was amazing how that still persisted. And he just kind of was like, it was like he was putting his 
thumb on the scale. You and have just you've just articulated. I mean, again, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you've just summarized the attitude. There was this elitism. Yeah. That was just pervasive. Yeah. And it wasn't just we're at the CIA, we're elite. It was, no, we're a case officer and we're yeah. elite. And the way that you said that, she was a reports officer. And it is true that Gina Haspel started as a reports officer. And then she battled her way to become a case officer. Yes. And that's what women of her generation, that's how you had to get there. You started as a clerk. You started as a reports officer. And they were like the first women Supreme Court justices. Who are, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor famously started as a secretary. Uh, th- th- you know, this this generation of amazingly resilient, resourceful women who were able to switch tracks and overcome yeah. that level of yeah. scorn. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And people who were just, and I think that were, you know, and, and you know, and it was amazing to me also that somebody was saying this kind of, you know, in this day and age and after she had accomplished everything that she had, I mean, she'd been. You know, deputy director of operate, deputy to the to the, the the DDO. She'd been a senior manager. She'd done all of these things. But like for some people, it was like still like, no, she's just that reports officer. Just that reports officer. You know, officer. and it really that that kind of I mean, it's I think that the agencies changed probably a lot, but that there is still that kind of chauvinism that persists yeah. in a certain class. And I think you're right that it's it is you know case officers. And it's a male kind of thing too. It is the bravado. It is the job, right? I mean, it exactly. Is, it's You're the, the fighter pilot. Yeah, exa- that's exactly yeah. right. You're Maverick. Yeah, right. You're Maverick. Right, right. Exactly. It's, You're it, James Bond. You're James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> How? Um, wait, can I just say? I'm sorry. Can I just say one of my favorite little details um, in the book, and I, I hope readers appreciate it, is the the people who worked in the Director of Science and Technology who were developing the gadgets and the weapons. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you know, the mm-hmm. the recorders and all of the fun spy gadgets, you know, that like James Bond would be given by yeah. Q. Yeah. They had a word for the case officers who inevitably would screw up the equipment, and they called them the Jameses. <laughs> and they said it with so the same good. scorn that the that the case officer would refer to as a as a, a reports officer. Yeah. They would say the Jameses, like he's gonna. How is he gonna screw it up? You know, Amazing. is he gonna drop? Is he gonna drop it? Is he gonna break it? Is yeah. he gonna fail to turn it on? Is he gonna fumble it? Is he gonna lose it? Yeah. And so I just love the fact that they referred to the case office, the the sort of brilliant nerds working yes. in the gadgets yes. office um, had their own derogatory yeah. term for the case. Their officers. own contempt for the, <laughs> the people they were working for. That's great. Yeah. So I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you, no, you, that's that's great. I mean, well, and, and Gina Haspel is actually is, is a good. It's a good turning point to t- talk about, um, I think, you know, when women enter this era of pre-9-11 and mm-hmm. post-9-11, which is mm-hmm. a huge turning point. It certainly was, I think, for her and her career. Um, you, you talk about so many women in, in this, but maybe let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Cindy Storer, who mm-hmm. you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. Tell us a little bit about her and the, the cohort of women that were around her in the, in the, in the 90s that were looking at this, you know, unusual guy that everyone mm-hmm. was overlooking, Osama bin Laden, and what they were figuring out about mm-hmm. his organization. Mm-hmm. And and so, uh, and let's also s- uh, clarify that up until now, we've been talking mostly about the clandestine service that collects intelligence and, yep. and sends it back to headquarters. But there's, uh, there's uh, it was almost a completely different institution. There was the analytic core. Yes. And these are officers who are hired for their brain work and their, um, their ability to sit at a desk and think and read all this intelligence and write up reports. Because that's the other thing the CIA is. It's a publishing house. That is how intelligence gets disseminated to the president and the national security community is that papers are written. There's the there's the president's daily brief every day. And if you're an analyst, what you want and need to do is write up an intelligence item that makes it into the president's yep. daily brief. It's that important that it gets that, that it's brought to the president and he or someday she perhaps, uh, is briefed on the most important um, potential crises. or uh, and, and so there's a whole other body of people who aren't out on the street, who aren't might be overseas, but not necessarily. They're, they're, they're reading all this intelligence as well as all sorts of other sources. And, and that th- there, there were some of the same problems in the, and in the director of intelligence, as it was called for most of that time, uh, in that men were assigned to the Soviet desk because that was the most mm-hmm. prestigious yeah. analytic desk. And so there, there was a pecking order in the analytic core. Like it was maybe a little more female friendly in the 70s and 80s, but not much. And and the same sorts of 
you know, what you said, the scorn and contempt for certain units that were predominantly female, like the Office of Leadership Analysis, Mm -hmm. was called Ladies Doing Analysis uh, because it just – there were various institutional reasons why that became – why that particular office was majority female and so it was looked down on. Um, so in the in the 1980s, under Ronald Reagan, uh, there is a bump up in hiring in general, uh, and not not at the beginning of the 80s, but uh, pretty soon under Ronald Reagan when he's you know built you know con- the contest with the evil empire and uh, a lot of covert action. So there's an expansion of the CIA workforce. There's um, for the first time there are equal opportunity commission type you know, agency offices that now exist and some expectation mm-hmm. of um, of more equity in hiring. And so a bunch, a whole generation of recently graduated women, you know, who've gone to co-educational colleges that perhaps had been uh, all male at one point. But, you know, this sort of first generation of post uh, Title IX um, young women who had uh, post-feminist movement, who had gone to co-educational colleges, proved themselves academically, thought the playing field was level, uh, were recruited into the analytic corps in particular and thought, yay, we've been to these great colleges and we have really good study skills and we've gotten really good grades all our lives and we come from patriotic, sometimes military families, like in Cindy's case. Mm -hmm. And we want to serve too. We believe in the U.S. government. We're smart girls, uh, smart young women, and we're going to, we're shopping at JCPenney's uh, to get our work gear and we're going to wear our banker suits and our pumps and we're going to do a great job and we're so excited to be here in Washington. And that was that was true of Cindy Storer. That was true of a whole cohort of young women who were hired sort of in the mid to late 80s when the CIA sort of said, OK, we need to start bringing in some more women. Right. So they were young and they were fresh faced and they were smart and they were careful and they were scared. They need you know, they wanted to measure up. They're like, woo, here we are. And we we need to prove themselves. And and they were coming into a workplace that was still predominantly male mm-hmm. and they were put into without really realizing it. They were channeled into some fields that were not the fast track, yeah. you know. So they were hired, but there was still a lot of institutional resistance. And they were often, it struck me, they were often put into these sort of niche analytic jobs where there was also a fair number of men who maybe had sort of dead ended uh-huh. and weren't that happy and didn't really want to help these newcomers and resented their presence. And like, because Cindy's first day at work at the National Photographic Imagery Center, I think I've got that. For, right. Yeah, into and, the and pick, yeah. Uh, the the um, sort of f- old former army guy who had been, uh, who was her mentor for the day, first thing he did was open the door of his desk and show her his porn collection, yeah. his collection of Swedish porn, just to let her know. And that happened over All and over time. to these women. It was like this the amazing time. theme of how often porn factored into their, uh, their welcome to the agency. And, um, and so she was like, Okay. Uh, she said she knew she was being tested and she just didn't say anything. Right. And uh, and so – but so they were simultaneously being sort of put in their place. They were being channeled into more obscure fields. In her case, it was – she was working at a completely different building, not at Langley. Um in in a in at, down at the waterfront near the Navy Yard, this imagery um, analysis center had been established to analyze aerial imagery being taken by the U two spy plane and this this technology that we had been developing, we being the United States, uh, developing during the Cold War to spy on on the Soviet Union and and other countries to mm-hmm. see what they're to look tra- and track their missile installations and their uh, are, are are they abiding by these treaties uh, the trust. Trust but verify era. Are they abiding by these nuclear treaties that, um, you know, have been signed? And so Cindy was taught how to look at aerial imagery and make out these shadowy figures and figure out, huh, is that an antenna array? Like are new communication systems being set up in this country? Are there going to be some missiles that are on the move that are being transported uh, to places that they uh, that they aren't where they aren't supposed to be missiles? And so she spent several years, as did a number of other women, um, learning imagery analysis, learning to look really carefully at uh, at puzzling phenomena, uh, at indistinct shapes. And to pay attention to how they change day to day, you know, she would get they would get fresh film every day. And so to track changes over time 
and 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 she was well taught the same the same sort of old farmy uh, old army guys that were uh, that were hazing her a little yeah. bit were also very good um, teachers and she she hmm. she learned to think of them as the curmudgeons and and she learned a lot from them and she learned how to she said how to tell a story how to tell the story of a particular missile system based on what was happening three years ago so how to write a compelling how to write up a yeah. compelling story about what seems to be taking place in whatever country. Sometimes she could tell me the country that she was working on, you know. I think sometimes, you know, they're working on North Korea or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, certain yeah. uh, looking at that country itself or what that country might be doing in another country. Uh, and so um, so learning to be careful, learning to be smart, learning how to um, make your case uh, that something is going on here. Uh, but But – also, anybody, anybody who was put in one of these, um, what they regard as sort of backwaters, mm-hmm. again, they weren't at Langley. They weren't full-fledged, all-source analysts. It's like when you talk about a case officer having scorn for a reports officer. Well, in the analytic core, what you want to be is an all-source analyst because that means you have access yep. to this large classified database to intelligence that's coming in from a, lar- a lot of um, different – uh, intelligence sources, but it, Cindy, where she was doing imagery analysis, she was not an all source analyst. She's just looking at images. She's looking at images, and so when she would communicate with the all source analysts at headquarters to try to persuade them, something was important. She was the lowest person on the totem pole, and she was made aware of that. So, what you want to be if you're an imagery analysis is you want to graduate to become an all source mm-hmm. analyst. And so, eventually, she did get the opportunity to rotate. She was on the um, Near East South Asia desk, which was itself a backwater. Yep. You know, again, just working his way up her way up through the institutional the banking jobs order. Men don't want or right. get shunted into. Or shunted yeah. into, and she was looking at Afghanistan mm-hmm. in 1989, mm-hmm. when the Soviets are being um, are being driven out of Afghanistan by the Stinger missile and. Uh, and, and by, you know, American hardware and American weaponry and help from the CIA. And and so she gets there at a really interesting, really, really, you know, pivotal time because the collapse of the Soviet Union itself will follow two years later. Um, but she's also getting there at a time when, OK, OK, the Soviets have left Afghanistan, so we don't really want to hear about Afghanistan anymore. Right. And uh, that's old news. Like there was something in Washington called Afghanistanism, which was, again, scorn for somebody who was interested in this obscure patch of the yeah. world that we don't really care about. And The ultimate and backwater. Right, the ultimate backwater. OK, the, you know, the Cold War. And then in, in 91, when the Soviet Union collapses, it's like, OK, yay. We've, we've won, we won and the threat is over and and so we don't really need to hear or want to hear about Afghanistan anymore but that's the desk that Cindy's on and she's like wait a second these um, this as she she goes and she reads some old papers that uh, some predecessors had written about these this phenomenon of foreign fighters these these um, Islamic fighters who uh, believe in jihad, believe in war against the West and war against the infidel, wherever the infidel, the non-believer, resides. And the Soviet Union were seen as infidels also. So they had traveled to Afghanistan from from all from the Middle East, from Africa, from all over uh, the world to fight, uh, to hang out and be funded by shadowy secret funders and to fight the Soviets. And then after the war, they weren't going home because, you know, many of them were criminals and they were wanted in their home countries. So they were they were going to training camps and they were going to Africa and they were meeting with other jihadists and, and setting up training camps and having communications. And, and so Cindy starts making sense of bits and pieces of information that she now has access to. And she starts seeing uh, patterns and, and sensing, again, like imagery analysis, sensing that that, that some shadowy thing is, and that was the word she used. She said, you know, as an analyst, it was my job to make the case that this is a thing. It's a thing. This is a thing. And, and to convince people that it's a thing. And, um, and, and she was up against so much more resistance than I think she realized. And also what is different about the CIA from journalism, and this is important even if it sounds like boring nuance, it's really not, 
if we as journalists believe that something is a thing, it's important. We can hammer our editor and hammer our editor and hammer our editor, and like finally maybe convince our editor who just has to convince maybe one other editor, like, okay, we'll run this story under Shane Harris's name or right. under Eliza Mundy's name. And and if Shane's gotten it wrong, you know, it's like it's his problem, right? It's yeah. our problem. But 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 there's a certain right. people you have to convince, but you don't have to convince the whole building. Right. And if you're a CIA analyst and you're writing about this shadowy group of people who are communicating with each other in Africa or Indonesia or the Middle East, you got to go to the uh, to the to each geographic desk. You've got to go maybe to the Soviet desk and then you've got to go to the Indonesia desk and you've got to go to all these analysts all around the building in order to write one thing. You're writing a corporate product. You're not signing your name, Cindy Store, to it. You got to you got to get buy in from everybody who has any stake in the in 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 the terrain uh, on every word. Yes. And so literally, she had and, and she wasn't alone. She had tennis shoes at her desk uh, to uh, to run. She you know if I wanted to, she wanted to write something for the President's Daily Brief, you have to persuade your manager. Uh, you have to persuade the the desk chief, and then you have to persuade all these colleagues. So, okay. So you're, you know, so I think you have done a very job conjuring the elitism that, that exists. And, and it is just really hard, particularly if you're, okay, now you're a 28 year old female who they know you started as an imagery analyst. They Mm -hmm. know that you came from over the river. You didn't start as an all sorts analyst. And so there are all these, what we would call cognitive bias now. Uh, these biases that that click into people's brains. Well, why am I going to listen to her? She works on the Afghanistan desk. She was an imagery analysis. She's a woman. She's a girl. uh, And um, she's not part of our network. And so that's what Cindy was up against as she started to piece together and really also to do a new kind of intelligence analysis. She wasn't reading like a purloined letter. You know, she wasn't reading... uh, a report that had been handed over by a Soviet asset that was written in intelligible Russian that if we could translate it, it was coherent. You know, she was reading intercepted communications in Arabic using code names and she was looking at travel documents and she got some financial records and she was cobbling together uh, an understanding just from an array of of a new kind of source. Right. Intelligence that was not collected through clandestine means and therefore some people in the agency thought it was less valuable. Right. 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 You you put it so well. Yeah. And and stuff from what was called open sources. Yeah. Um, Little news articles in in, uh, in newspapers that nobody else had heard of. Or even like speeches by bin Laden. Speeches by bin Laden. Which in in which she's telling you, this is what we're going to do. And you have this great part in the book where when she's talking about that you can see them talking about what Al Qaeda talking about what their goals are, right? Talking about the kind of people they want to right. recruit, right? You can follow the money that's moving right. around. And there's this moment yeah. where she realizes this is an organization. This is a bureaucracy. They're right. they're writing about desk chairs. Yes, they're buying desk chairs. Oh, look, these are onboarding documents. They're signing on the dotted line to yeah. work for Al Qaeda. Yeah, and isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah, and doesn't that yeah. mean something? Yeah, yeah. They're they're yes, they're not funded by a state government. They're not like Hezbollah. Uh, they are they're their own organization. Yeah. And to persuade people in Washington that that was a thing, that that was a thing to worry about. Yeah, they don't have their own military. They don't have uniforms. They don't, um, you know, they're not... They, <laughs> They're not a country. Yeah, and, and clearly the entire intelligence community, well, the entire, but the majority of the intelligence community has a blind spot to, you know, al-Qaeda before 9-11 as well. And I mean, it's For that only, reason. Yeah, and it's only in retrospect that we realize mm-hmm. that people like Cindy Store and others who worked in Alex Station, which was the unit tracking right. bin Laden, right. were on to it. Right. And were figuring it out. Right. And those warnings were just not getting picked up. In the system, and there's so many women who who worked in roles, and we, we can't talk about all of them. Um, but I want to a- ask you a little bit about another one who this you know, after 9/11, when everyone realizes, you know, these analysts that were tracking Bin Laden were correct, and these warnings were pr- were prescient. Um, Jennifer Matthews, mm-hmm. um, you know, who plays a, a, tell, tell the story of Jennifer Matthews, and in, 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 this is I alluded to, you know, tragic stories yeah. in the beginning of our conversation, and hers yeah. really is one of them. So Jennifer Matthews also started as an <clears throat> imagery analyst, and uh, and. So so she came in, I think, just a couple years after Cindy, and she, um, her friend Kristen Wood, uh, 
uh, also came in as imagery, as an imagery analyst and, and literally in the same class. She said, we were on the bus, you know, we got, went through orientation at headquarters and then we were put on the bus to wherever we were going to work. And there were four of us there in the back of the bus. It was the last drop off point. This was the imagery, a, you know, analysis center <laughs> the over the river in this really the dangerous yeah. part of Southeast yeah. Washington at the, you know, in the crack epidemic. Nobody wanted to work there uh, for all sorts of reasons. And so the women became a very tight group uh, who were who were over there uh, across the river doing analysis. And and Kristen remembered the day when Jennifer Matthews came and said, well, there's this I'm being recruited to or I'm going to join. I, I don't know if she went straight into Alex Station, but uh, they would maybe she went over as an analyst first and then um, or target her and uh, and then got recruited into Alex Station, which was this very strange uh, so-called virtual station uh, that where um, a, a boss named Mike Scheuer, who had been recruited, as he says, because nobody else wanted to do it, to look at bin Laden um, at a time when this was just like he was nobody. I mean, it just couldn't be a less Im- important, per- perceived important um, area of, of study. So Jennifer uh, gets, Jennifer Matthews gets recruited into Alex Station, a very small unit of female analysts who are beginning to develop this um, this skill called targeting and and are are doing operational work without having operational training uh, through no fault of their own it's just sort of nobody's paying attention mm-hmm. they've they've formed this kind of weird experimental small unit to look at bin Laden and figure out is he a money man? They, it was thought that he was funding other terrorist groups. And so, OK, let's figure out who this guy is. Um, and so who wants this job? Nobody except some women uh, who are willing because this seems interesting. Like there's, if they're stymied in the bureaucracy and maybe they wanted to do some operational work, but they weren't recruited into the operational directorate, the clandestine directorate. Well, here's a way to do some kind of different, interesting work that's not quite desk work like you are working with the field. You're starting, you know, you're asking case officers overseas, look, could you? Could you could you pick up some documents for me? Like there's a lawsuit going on overseas. Could you ask this liaison force to give us that lawsuit or to give us these financial filings? These charities, these um, you know, these NGOs that say that they're helping Afghan refugees, but we think they're actually funneling money to Al Qaeda. So could you ask your liaison service to pick up these financial documents so we can say, are they really a charity or you know, are they actually running arms or are, yeah. are funding weaponry? And so so Jennifer was one of the early uh, analysts who were recruited into uh, this this unit of analysts, but who were communicating with the clandestine service overseas and um, and being looked down on because they were women. They were described as sneaker ladies, as women in tennis shoes, uh, and because they worked at desks. Mm-hmm. They they worked at desks. They did. They hadn't even been overseas operations officers, and uh, and yet they. They were just pioneering, not just, they were pioneering this new kind of intelligence gathering and this ability to make sense of scattered data and communications between individual people. Again, getting back to Eloise Page and hunting Nazis. Yep. Um, but, but again, these are people who are communicating with other people. And so they're developing the ability to say, OK, person X in one country is communicating with person Y. And we know this because we're intersecting their communications, or at least we know that they are communicating. And they're they're both communicating with the bomb maker in, in a third location. And oh, look, that line's getting darker and darker because they're really talking to that bomb maker a lot. And and so they're doing, you know, what, what software can now do yes. instantly, they're doing in a very laborious way. So they're understanding who's communicating with whom, who's traveling, how they're traveling, who they're working with, uh, what communication systems they're tapping. And so Jennifer Matthews um, was was one of the primary people uh, in that small unit who was building the agency's capacity to do that kind of work. And then uh, she stayed with the work after uh, 9-11 um, working as a targeter and, and, and teaching other officers how to become targeters. And, and often these fellow officers were women. They were coming after 9-11, there was this great reshuffling at the CIA and, and, 
and and officers get thrown into say this new targeting effort to track down the terrorists who just are dispersing after 9/11 all over the world they're leaving Afghanistan and they have to be found again even if we knew where they were in Afghanistan now they're somewhere else so so these targeters have to get better and better and we need more and more of them and they they're brought in from like the office of leadership analysis that was regarded as ladies doing analysis yep. they're all these nuanced but interesting and important institutional reasons why women become targeters why the targeting core is primarily female and so jennifer matthews has a personal sense of failure uh, at, at because 9-11 did happen. And the whole agency has a of sense course. of collective failure, but there are individuals who feel that failure more than others and who are made to feel that failure with the 9-11 Commission report. These analysts who had been calling attention like Cindy Storer, they're called out in the report. And of course, that report has to happen. We have to understand why 9-11 happened, why um, Oh, it wasn't it wasn't stopped or we didn't know that these these terrorists were going to hijack planes, you know, that, who didn't have an army, who didn't have a military. Oh, they're going to use our, you know, yeah, our exactly. systems as weapons. Yeah. Uh, and so there, there had to be a reckoning. But the individual analysts were just devastated and coping with a sense of failure at the same time that they have to make sure there's not a second wave of attacks. Absolutely. And, and so the people who knew how to do this are are, you know, processing tr- their own trauma and yet having to get up every morning to do the work. And Jennifer Matthews was one of them. So she stays uh, and she, I think, develops a real personal relationship with bin Laden in the sense of I'm going to get him. I have to get him. I have to get him. And and a very seasoned targeter teaching other targeting officers how to do this work. Um, And and ultimately she becomes base chief at the station and coast that is – targeting people for drone strikes and 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 there's this tragic uh double agent is double agent or triple agent I think it's actually Tri- a triple, triple agent, agent yeah. right and so um you, you, maybe you could explain the well, triple he, agent part of well, it. Well, it's, it's we think he's Al Qaeda who has flipped to work for us, but he's right. actually still working for Al Qaeda, right? Or not for us, right. but for the for an, that he's betrayed Al Qaeda, right. but really he hasn't. He's right. convinced everyone that he has. Right, right. Yeah. And so the result of this is this terrible um, meeting where he's admitted to the base. He's not searched. He has a suicide vest on. He's welcomed. He's presented with a birthday cake. He Because they think he's coming to give them right, information on Bin Laden. They think he's coming to give the information that's going to enable the CIA to, 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 to find Bin Laden. Yeah. And, and instead, he blows up the uh, – group of of officers yeah. and and the driver and Jordanian liaison officers mm-hmm. and uh it's just a horrible horrible day i mean it's just unimaginably tragic and Jennifer Matthews dies uh in the explosion and um and the the, the devastation at the CIA the devastation among the targeting core um because i talked to one of her colleagues a woman who said, you know, at that point as targeters, we were in various da- very dangerous places overseas doing work that we never knew, you know, that we were going to be doing. We had been training on a desk, but eventually these women were often deployed overseas to work with people, you know, who were in uh, in dangerous locations, and again, they hadn't they hadn't received full clandestine training through no fault right. of their own. Right. And and so they were doing operational work without really having often had operational training. So the kind of meeting that that Jennifer Matthews and the others are involved in, which is being run by headquarters, you know, higher ups at headquarters, yeah, know how it's going to go own. down, yeah. right? They're not, she's not, you know, making decisions on her own. Uh, uh, meetings like that are are clandestine you know, operational meetings. And uh, and so the targeter said to me, she said, you know, we had been basically a lot of targeting officers had been put in very dangerous situations courting this kind of, she, you know, taking real risks yeah. um, in the post 9-11 period to try to run these terrorists to ground. And so th- this particular targeting officer said, you know, I don't, I don't think we've ever recovered from that. Yeah. Uh, from from knowing that they too had been in situations where this kind of thing could have happened, but of course it was the it was the tragedy at Coast that um, that galvanized the agency into okay, 
you know, we're going to reinvigorate the hunt. We've been distracted by the war in Iraq. Yes. Uh, our resources were taken off. But, you know, Barack Obama says this has got to – tells Director Panetta at the time this has got to be your priority. Absolutely. We're going to get him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's yeah, – yeah. you're right. Galvanizing is the word. I mean, it's I think it was the single greatest loss of life for the agency yeah. since Beirut. Right. And exactly. the embassy bombing in, exactly. in the 80s. Yeah. What, were there people – I mean, there, were, there was a lot of after action, obviously, analysis of what happened at Coast and what went wrong. Wrong. And Jennifer Matthews came in for a lot of criticism. Were there people who were who were saying a man wouldn't have made these decisions? Were there people who wanted to say this was because she was a woman? Yes. And they would pick up on things like, oh, the birthday cake. Oh, the look, what cake. a girly thing to do. That she was offering made birthday cake. for this man who was coming. Right. When in fact, case officers <clears throat> offer the smallest trinkets and food is a big part of it to their <laughs> assets. I mean, people would tell me, male and women, I, I bought pizzas. I, I flew out with Georgetown cupcakes in my lap <laughs> to Nigeria <laughs> because somebody had seen the on the food. Food network, yep. like you do anything to to butter to to butter up the person that you're Absolutely. recruiting, and so um, one female case officer said, she said, you know, we had candy at our station, and you know, one of the African stations, and one of the male case officers was always taking candy to give to his assets, and they were like, come on, get your own candy, like. <laughs> so I mean, that sounds stupid, but 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 so those sorts of details were picked up on as in a, in what we would call a gendered way. Yeah. To belittle and minimize her when, in fact, that was just a – that was a common tactic. Totally. You know, it seems laughable, but it's just part of the recruitment process. And as Alcohol, you said, they were never trained to do this. They yeah, were figuring it out. Right. But she was doing the things that you would do to – The things that you would to do. To attract an asset and show trust and, yes. and demonstrate yes. um, um, commitment or interest. Right. Right, right. And, and you know, I, I did interview female, longtime female members of the clandestine service who did say, uh, this is how I would have done it. I would have met him yeah. alone. You never meet him. You know, it's always one-on-one. -on -one. You you meet an asset one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, Heidi August, who I interviewed, you know, said I would have, she was thinking I, I would have gotten him to an airport where, you know, there would have been, we would have met in a lounge at an airport, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, but again, these were operational decisions that were being, they have an expression at the CAA, the 3,000 mile screwdriver, you know, from headquarters, yeah. um, uh, you know, querying an operation. Well, how are you going to do this? And how are you going to do this? And how are you going to do that? And it may well be that in the wake of 9-11, there were so many operations going on, you know, in so many places that, uh, you know, I, I but there was still a, a three thousand mile or ten, five thousand mile or you know however screwdriver uh, from Langley yeah. you know tinkering with um, and adjusting uh, the details of operations. Yeah. So to have a meeting like that would not have been something that she would have decided on her own. And do you think you know in, in, in the time we have left, it, it's where where are women at the agency today? I mean, Gina Haspel has been director, of course, of Real Haynes is the first mm -hmm. female mm -hmm. director of national intelligence. I think all, nearly every deputy director slot has now been filled by a mm -hmm. woman, the DDO, the DDI, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. others. I mean, so where is the CIA yeah. in terms of like what, what women do and can do there? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some people I talked to when, when Gina Haspel was director, I think that she had – I think there was one point maybe all the deputy directors were women. I think that's right. And, and yeah. people did not necessarily see that as um, – as, uh, as an advancement in the sense that historically there were male directors and, and male um, division chiefs who had these groups of loyalists that were female, that women who sort of were their um, acolytes, who had their back, who who helped m make them excellent and make them good. This is something that male bosses would say often to the female analysts. You're gonna, you make me look good in meetings. You know, so mm -hmm. they would bring, and, and they they felt like Gina didn't have, they, they were not men at the CIA who were making her look good in meetings and holding her up in the same way so that she appoints women to head each directorate and they were saying like where are the men who are supporting where's her praetorian you know why why so is she having to surround herself with yeah. women and there aren't aren't some men too and now, whether or not that's the right way to look at it i don't know but they didn't feel like she was getting the support necessarily from the men in the workforce you know in terms of where women are at the agency now it's still tough to be a female case officer overseas it's tough for a man as well it's still tough to get your uh your your, your spouse and your children to follow you if you're a case officer, a female case officer. I talked to Abigail Spanberger, who's a member of Congress, and she was case officer overseas. And she did have a spouse who could 
travel and work um, remotely and, and, and have children. And, and she would go off and, you know, be in, communic- in a communicado for days at a time and make that work. But even but she even finds that being a politician, being a member of Congress is more family friendly, you know, than being an overseas uh a CIA officer. She left the the, the agency to, to become, you know, to enter politics. So I think there are still challenges, but, but, but there's important advancements. And one thing I want to say about the hunt for bin Laden, uh, it, many things I'd like to say about the hunt for bin Laden, because it was a group of very seasoned, very tenacious, very well-trained female targeters who were the most confident, you know, when they had these meetings around the table and maybe the CIA director would be there and, and the higher ups, and they would say, well, what's your level of confidence that bin Laden is in that compound? Some of the higher level officials, maybe who had been through the, you know, weapons of mass destruction debacle, we're like, oh, well, we, you know, we think he is, but we've been wrong before. Uh, and it was really the targeters, often the female targeters closest to, um, uh, to closest to the analysis who were most confident that he was there. But important, another important diversity measure that uh, that is better than it was before is the ability to have children to sometimes work part time and to still be allowed to stay on an important case. So there's there were in the hunt for bin Laden, one of the things they had to do, which is similar to what the Venona codebreakers had to do, was go back and look at old evidence, information that had come in 10 years earlier, right after 9-11, that we didn't understand yet. We didn't, a certain names that were really important that we didn't yet understand were important. So 10, you have to go back and back and back to mine this data set. There's new information coming in, you know, new people being apprehended. And so to reconsider, to look back at an old data set, we say, wait a second, that name Oh, I see that now. That that was a really important. Oh, oh, that's the courier. The, yeah. Oh my yeah. God! And so there were. So there were. You have to go back and back, and you have to reframe how you're going to look at it. So there was a key moment where they said, "Okay, we're looking for this guy, Bin Laden." anywhere in the world. And we have all this great communications technology now and all this, you know, the NSA has some great ability to analyze voice tapes and things like that. So we've got this good technology, but he doesn't use technology. He's, you know, he's offline. He's not using cell phones. He's not on the internet. And so, and so who's communicating with him? Oh, okay. So, so there was an important reframing. Let's look at, so we need to look at his family members. We need to look at his couriers. We need to look at the communications media. Like, so let's be strategic. So the, 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 a key reframing was, was suggested and paper written by a part-time mother, working mother, who had stayed with the fight, who had been allowed, I use that sort of with quotation marks, to stay in this high, important, high-profile endeavor, which wouldn't have happened during the 1980s and the 1990s. If, and, and I interviewed Fran Moore, you know, who ultimately became deputy director of intelligence and was deputy director of intelligence during this, uh, during the hunt for bin Laden. And she, early in her career, when she insisted upon having children, was told, well, you can't be a manager mm-hmm. then. You can't have the high profile accounts. You can't be a manager. And she had to fight and fight and fight. So finally, we were at a moment where when we're thinking about diversity, we're not just thinking about men and women or letting gay and lesbian, letting, you know, yeah. uh, letting gay and lesbian officers work uh, in the clandestine service. Or uh, we're, we're not just thinking about ra- racial diversity. We're thinking about, OK, somebody is a working parent, but they have incredible skills. And so we're going to we're going to keep them on this desk. Yeah. And so I think, and this is important, you know, in terms of the ability to keep your job and have a family life, which a lot of people want to do, uh, I think it's better. You know, three years ago, finally, federal officers, federal employees got paid maternity and paternity leave. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, I think, you know, there are certainly, uh, in, both in terms of the way women are are looked at and regarded and certain positions are regarded and institutionally the way they're it's possible now to continue working uh when you get married and when you have children like that's a newer phenomenon than we than we really realize how much of your own experience as as a as a professional woman and and someone who's who's worked in a business that has been historically dominated by men how much of your experience resonated with you or 
did you find kind of mirrored the women that you were writing about? Yeah, thanks for asking. How much time do you have? So much of what, of what yeah. they encountered, I, I felt I had encountered in the newsroom. You'd you know, I came it. to yeah. work for the Washington Post in the early 90s, yeah. and um, I didn't have kids at the time, but I uh, – I remember, you know, first of all, being a foreign correspondent was the the plum job is equivalent to being a case officer. And it was how you became editor of the newspaper. You yeah. know, you came up through the ranks that way. And that was just so hard for women. You just couldn't to get your family to follow you. So the so there weren't nearly as many women foreign correspondents. And if they were, they were single women. Uh, either at the beginning of their careers and still single or, or just committed uh, to an unmarried life. Or they were tandem couples um, who uh, were working together, often two for the price of one and a half. Yeah. Like the, like the, the newspaper yes. realized, okay, we'll let – you had to be already married because the Post had this anti-nepotism thing. So if you – if you, you couldn't yeah. – you, you, you couldn't come to work for the Washington Post if you were – if you were married to, so you had to have met in the newsroom and right. gotten married, right? Uh, and, and there were so a couple. Like there were a couple <laughs> couples like that, so they got to go overseas. But that yeah. was a, so. So so that I, I start I, I started having children, you know, about about a year and a half. So that wasn't really going to be open to me okay. uh, as. Uh, and and there was a period of time where, um, as a as a working mother of young children, um, you know, and it's so interesting to me. This is that like the United Auto Workers want this now. They want a four day work week. Uh, and, and so they're like, you know, guys working in factories who yeah. want this. But I remember saying to my boss, you know, could I work for 80 percent of the pay and work a four day work week and still be a staff writer on the magazine? Right. And I remember my boss at that point saying, well, you can go to four days a week. But if you do that, there are going to be all sorts of jobs over the newsroom that you are not going to be considered for. Uh -huh. Just said it explicitly. And we couldn't work remotely at that time. And and so and and I, I do remember, uh, you know, I, I, the moments like that Cindy Storer had, I, I also remember, I, you know, I wrote some about reproductive politics. I also, during the 90s, you know, I wrote about um, uh, Janet Reno. And mm -hmm. it, the 90s were this pivotal time when Alex Station was being formed and there was a lot of confusion about gender roles and yeah. things. And I had written about a lot of that. But um, I remember I was also writing about the anti-abortion movement and reproductive politics. And I remember uh, a higher up, very nice uh, uh a highly placed um, man in the newsroom who uh, said, you know, you write about like abortion and things like that. Like, is that was sort of a niche topic? And, and, and he didn't, he, it wasn't, he didn't mean it to be belittling. It was, yeah. but, but it was, it like, do it was to him like it was a strange topic and not so that important. Yeah. And like, what has, what has fueled the Supreme Court appointments, you know, for the past 20 years? Yeah. Like, what is driving <laughs> potentially this, you know, this presidential election? What? <laughs> And and so, but and my again, colleague Caroline just won a Pulitzer last right, year for writing about abortion. Right, I mean, right. And so, yeah. twenty years ago, that was seen. That's amazing. It was like following Al Qaeda. You know, it's like why? Why would you want to talk yeah, about that? That's kind of a girly thing. Yes. To, yeah. And so, uh, so there were many points of where I, I felt that I identified. You totally got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So a thanks for asking. <laughs> well, there's a great line in your bio too that I just love that you wrote. You said at various points she has worked full time, part time, all night at home, in the office, remotely, in person, on trains, in the car, alone with other people in dangerous places under duress and while simultaneously making dinner. And and it's yeah, like, that's all true. Yeah. It's all true, <laughs> totally. But I, mean, it's, it's, I think it gives people a sense of like, I think one, one of the things that you bring to writing about these women is that you've had to go through professional life as a woman. You've had to work in male-dominant societies. You've had to do all of these things. I mean, it strikes me. And because journalism and intelligence work is so similar, it probably gave you – maybe a keener insight into it than you might otherwise have had. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. I certainly was very interested in it. And I got to say that when I look at, now when I look at cable news, it's like it's all women. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, and, and the same is true in newsrooms and in magazines. I mean, there have been, it's been, so when you say what's it like at the CIA, I uh, I, I hope it's what it's like in newsrooms because yeah. it's just, it's, uh, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's. I mean, and we have a, the first female executive editor of the right. Washington Post. Exactly. Now, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Do you think CIA will have you out to talk about the book? I, I hope don't know. They do. I don't know. I don't know. 
uh, the, I did, you know, I talked in the bubble for Code Girls yeah. uh, because that was a, um, a popular book in the intelligence community sure. because I, I think it makes people feel very good about we won World War II. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and yeah. I think people are always interested to know, you know, who has come before, who are the pioneers is a cliche word to use. But uh, it, 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 winning World War II is seen as a, as a, as a happy ending, you know, to a tragic right, right. narrative. And, um, and so I, I guess it, it remains to be seen. Uh, uh, it well, remains to be seen. I hope the historian at least calls yeah. over and maybe gives you an idea I, for your next book. Too, I, hope right? so, I hope so. Do you too. want to keep? Do you, do you do you have an interest in continuing to write about intelligence? Uh, there are more I'll, stories you want to do? Yeah, I'll see. I mean, it's funny. I um, I a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, I filed a bunch of Freedom of Information Act requests of the NSA. Ooh. And for a long time during the pandemic, you know, FOIA requests re- weren't being filled and there was a long lag. And so I'm starting to get these brown manila envelopes <laughs> just in the mail. Back. Like literally one came yesterday. Wow. And the thing is, I don't remember what the FOIAs were. Totally. And so I've got, I haven't had a chance yet. I've got a stack. It's like Christmas presents. I've got a stack of brown manila envelopes. Uh, from NSA FOIAs uh, in, on my desk, and so maybe. The next book might be in there. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's our tradition on Chatter for the last question as I reach into the Chatterbox <laughs> here, and I pull out at random a pre-written question, and this is going to be my last question for you. Okay, this is a good one. Oh, this is <laughs> journals like this. Uh, what common misperception about your profession or specialty makes your blood boil? What do people get wrong about journalism or historians or or book authors that is just not true, but it's a common misconception that persists? You well, think? you know, a misperception that I had and that, that I think does persist is that journalists are really aggressive and they get their stories by hammering on people's doors and mm-hmm. um, and and being obnoxious and 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 maybe you know that's true sometimes. sometimes. You have to shouting yeah. questions at the president as well, you know, or harassing people or. Um, Invading their privacy. And I have found as a reporter who wants people to talk to me for a long time and to open up and that um, it helps to uh, get your hair um, blow dried and look nice and put on um, nice clothes yeah. and knock at the door and be really polite. Yeah. And and certainly for uh, Code Girls, when I was interviewing women in their 90s, I would bring flowers sometimes to their mm. assisted living facility. Like, wow. like and being a decent person yes. and uh, and and assuring your, your sources that you are going to listen to them for as long as they want to talk to you and you're going to come back and back and you're going to check it and you're going to get it right and that you really want to hear what they have to say. Uh, I... I so I think that might be a misperception yeah. about journalists um and uh and and it's funny I I learned this from a colleague at the Washington Post who was writing a profile of John McCain and he was trying to get some of his um classmates at the Naval Academy to talk to him and he would present himself at the door you know I mean cuz sometimes you have to you can call and you can yeah. email but sometimes you just have to knock on the door yeah. and he said whenever I did it I would get my hair cut and I would get my shoes shined nice. so that you know these Naval Academy graduates would would think I was legit and yeah. and I thought ooh, ooh, that's a good idea it, it works <laughs> I mean, look nice and be nice be nice and yeah, be polite, polite when yeah. you show up yeah, on their doorstep. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah, I mean you have to be tenacious and you of have course. to be, you know, tough and and and. But uh, but it anyway. That's that's yeah. just uh, it's not always pounding on doors exactly. and yelling at people. Journalists are nice people too. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, Liza Mundy, the book is the Sisterhood: The Secret History of Women at the CIA. It's a tremendous book. We only scratch the surface of so many of the terrific stories that are in here. Uh, but thank you for coming on the show and thank you for writing it. It's a really important piece of history, and I think people are going to really enjoy it. Thank you for your work and thank you for letting me come into the studio. It's so nice to do it in person. It's great to see you. Thanks. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.